Hi, this is Ed Rudiger, and once again, I am delighted that you're tuning in to hear another one of my sermons. Now, I'm preaching this one on uh, January 30th in my church in Sligo, Pennsylvania. That's Sligo Presbyterian Church. We're about 10 miles south of Clarion in western Pennsylvania. Uh, this is a, a sermon uh, based on uh, Matthew 6, 5 through 15. So here the word of God is written by the evangelist Matthew. When you pray, don't be like those who, those show-offs who love to stand up and pray in the meeting places and on street corners. They do this just to look good. I can assure you that they already have received their reward. When you pray, go into your room alone and close the door. Pray to your father in private. He knows what is done in private and he will reward you. When you pray, don't talk on and on as people who, who don't know God. They think God likes to hear long prayers. Don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask. You should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, help us honor, to honor your name. Come and set up your kingdom so that everyone on earth will obey you as you were obeyed in heaven. Give us our food for today. Forgive us for doing wrong as we forgive others. Keep us from being tempted and protect us from evil. If you forgive others for the wrongs they do to you, your Father in heaven will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. As I hope you all already know, we're in the middle of a, of a sermon series we started a few weeks ago entitled, Living the Call, Seven Ways to Live as Followers of Jesus Christ. You see, during this period between Epiphany, the end of the Christmas season, and the beginning of Lent, which of course leads to Easter, we're talking about seven things we might want to do as Christian disciples. And a couple of weeks ago, we kicked it off by talking about how, before we can do anything else, followers of Jesus need to make the decision that they're actually going to do it. You know, follow. Something that happens when we decide to open our minds and to leave behind our past and to move into our future. Now, that was week one. And last week, we looked at how followers of Christ may also want to grow in the word. Something that's certainly possible when we decide to take the Bible and do the three L's. Namely, to love it, and to learn it, and to live it. And that was week two. And this week we're going to look at the third thing that I believe will help us live the call we've received from Christ. And now I'm talking about praying to God in faith. And I'll tell you personally, I think prayer is one of those topics that, well, it kind of unites Christians. I mean, I believe most of us really think it's important, but most of us also think that we probably could be better, better doing it. And I'll tell you, I think that's why if you stroll through a Christian bookstore or thumb through a catalog, you'll probably find a whole section devoted to prayer. As a matter of fact, just a few days ago, I ran across an article on the Presbyterian Church website entitled, Praying for Others, Ask Questions, and Keep It Simple. Now, if you're interested in reading it, you can find it if you scroll down the SPC uh, Facebook page or check out our blog. The, the address is in the bulletin. Anyway, it was written by a hospital chaplain, and she was saying that, in her opinion, praying for others is a collaborative effort. In other words, sometimes we do it for others, and sometimes others do it for us. But it involve, always involves us and we. Now, that's what she said. And even though I think her point is spot on, the article itself shows me that prayer, well, it's a pretty big deal for Christians. And for that reason, that's going to be our focus this morning. We're going to talk about how we, as people called by Jesus Christ, can pray in and with faith. And to do that, we'll take this passage from the Sermon on the Mount and look at four things that we can trust as we approach God in prayer something that I hope will improve our praying. For example, when we pray, we can trust that God has interest, you know, interest in us. In other words, God wants us to pray because he has a real interest in what we have to say. 
And I'll tell you, I think that's why before he got into the actual praying itself, Jesus gave his disciples and he gives us all kinds of guidelines in the passage we just read. I mean, remember he said, when you pray, don't don't be like those show-offs who love to stand up and pray in the meeting places and on street corners. They do this just to look good. I can assure you they have already received their reward. When you pray, go into a room alone and close the door. Pray to your father in private. He knows what is done in private and he will reward you. When you pray, don't talk on and on as people who don't know God. They think God likes to hear long prayers. Don't be like them. Your father knows what you need before you ask. Now, that's what Jesus said. And you know, based on that, it seems pretty clear that God really likes us to pray with humility and with privacy and with as few words as possible, something that should probably be including the tr- included in the training of every minister. You see, this is what God likes because he simply wants us to pray. And I'll tell you, when we recognize this, I think how we pray changes a little bit. I mean, if I believe God really isn't all that interested in what I have to say or that if I'm not careful, my prayers could really get on God's last nerve, man, I'm going to approach him with some real doubt, trepidation, maybe even some genuine fear and trembling. My goodness, if if I say something that kind of ticks him off, then where will I be? No, if I'm not sure that God is interested in hearing from me, well, how could I not be hesitant? But you know, if that's reversed, and if I trust that God really does want me to talk because he's interested in what I have to say, that may lead me to to be a little bit bold in my prayers. Man, I think I'll feel the freedom to, to pray as much and as often as I can. And my prayers will become more conversations with a friend than a petition to a deity. And who knows? If we're able to accept this truth about God, we may actually be able to identify with what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. Always be joyful and never stop praying. Whatever happens, keep thanking God because of Jesus Christ. This is what God wants you to do. You see, I believe our prayers become more often and less formal when we trust that God has interest. And that's one. And second, when we pray, I also believe we can trust that God has authority. In other words, that regardless of what we offer up, God can address our needs and concerns. Simply put, God is free from all those things that limit us. And you know, I think we can see a recognition of that reality in the very prayer Jesus gave his disciples to pray. You know, the one in the passage I just read. Now, a few minutes ago, we used the contemporary English, but let's get real. We're a whole lot more comfortable with the same verses from the King James. After this manner, therefore pray ye. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You see, this is the one who hears our prayers. And I'm talking about the one who dwells in heaven and whose name is holy and whose will is going to be done on earth just like it is in heaven. You see, the one who has interest in us also has authority. And if this is something that we remember, and I'm talking about when we go to him in prayer, then I believe how we pray changes. For example, there's no way we can pray without hope, wondering about whether our need exceeds his power. Man, that's not just not going to happen. Instead, we'll be able to share with God exactly what's going on, won't we? And we'll do it even when the problems we face seem enormous, at least to us. And we'll do it even when the odds are definitely against us. You know, like being behind by three points with 13 seconds to play. It's like the writer to the letter to the Hebrew said. So whenever we are in need, we should come bravely before the throne of our merciful God. There we will be treated with undeserved kindness and we will find help. I'll tell you, I believe we'll be able to pray with hope when we trust that God really does have authority, and that's two. And third, I also think our prayers become different when our trust in God, when we trust that God has compassion. In other words, that God cares about us. 
You see, whether we like it or not, God doesn't just tolerate us, nor does he just put up with us. And contrary to what that great Puritan preacher, Jonathan Edwards, said in his most famous sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, the God that holds us over the pit of hell, much as he holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, does not abhor us, nor is he dreadfully provoked. You see, our God just plain loves us. And that's why Jesus told his disciples that they should ask God for help, that they had that right, that they had that ability. Remember, he said again from, from the King James, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. You see, God has compassion for us, his children. And I'll tell you, just knowing that changes the way we approach him. I mean, where in the past we may have thought God was actually irritated by something, you know, that that was his usual state of mind. And then in his sight, sometimes we really are like loathsome insects dangling over the fires of hell. That shouldn't be our perspective anymore. You see, although we may fear Jonathan Edwards' angry God, we can approach the one who's perfect in his love with both confidence and joy. It's sort of like John wrote in his first letter. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You see, I believe we'll pray with a more positive attitude and outlook when we trust that God has compassion, and that's three. And fourth, when we pray, we can trust that God has expectations. In other words, that God is looking for us to respond. Now, let me be clear, I'm not saying that God's concern for us is conditional and that he only loves us when we're lovable. Let's face it, if that were the case, outside of a couple of y'all who will remain nameless, most of us are in big trouble. Now, I'm not saying that at all. Still, for us to understand and to experience his compassion fully, we really need to be willing to show it to others. And I'll tell you, I think that's why Jesus ended his little lesson on prayer with this. If you forgive others for the wrongs they do to you, your Father in heaven will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. I mean, let's get real. How in heaven's name can I ever understand the nature of forgiveness or truly appreciate the fact that I've been forgiven if I'm not willing to pass a little of that forgiveness on to others? But I don't think we should limit this to forgiving. Suppose God answers my prayers and gives me more food than I need for the day. You see, since I'm praying not for my, but for our daily bread, might not God want me to share some of my, some of my extra with those of us who don't have enough? Frankly, I think he does because I believe God has expectations. And I'll tell you, because of that, after we pray, we probably shouldn't sort of sit around and do nothing and wait for the blessings to pour in. Instead, maybe we should do for those around us, particularly those who aren't on the top, maybe we should show them the same sort of stuff that we trust that God shows us. In other words, maybe we should take an interest in them and open ourselves so that we can hear what they have to say. And maybe we should recognize that even though it certainly has limitations, we have enough authority and power to make the lives of those who are often ignored better. And maybe, just maybe, we should muster up some compassion so that we can fulfill these words from Jesus himself. Whenever you did it for any of my people, no matter how unimportant they seemed, you did it for me. You see, whenever we approach God in prayer, we can trust that he has expectations. And that's fourth, and that's... Now, I expect prayer to remain a hot topic among Christians. And I also expect that people will continue to write articles and books on how we might be more effective in our prayers. And even though I think that's perfectly fine, let's remember that when we pray, we can trust that God has interest and authority, that he has compassion and expectations. In other words, regardless of the techniques we may choose to use, 
as men and women called by Jesus Christ, we can follow him by praying in faith. Amen. Well, again, I am so glad you're tuning in to hear this sermon. I hope, hope you found it meaningful. Uh, also remember that uh, if you're ever in the neighborhood, and that's Sligo, Pennsylvania, about uh, 10 miles south of Clarion off of Interstate 80, uh, we sure invite you to come to Sligo Presbyterian Church right in the center of town. Uh, 10 o'clock Sunday morning we worship. Love to have you with us. We have a uh, a Bible study on 1030 on Wednesday morning, and you're certainly invited to come to that as well. And so until I talk with you again, I want you to remember that you are a child of God, and God loves you very much. Goodbye for now. <laughs>